My name is Erasmus, chief bookkeeper and trusted friend of Hafid, one of the most successful salesmen who ever lived. The story I have to tell is timeless, not because it concerns Hafid or me, but because it reveals some enduring truths that transcend all ages and all time. I shall never forget that morning in ancient Damascus. I was checking the inventory of my employer's vast warehouse. Wool, linen and carpets from Asia Minor, ginger, cinnamon, and precious stones from Arabia, alabaster from Egypt, tapestries from Babylon, and paintings and statuary from Rome. In the semi-darkness and intent upon my work, I was wholly unaware that Hafid had also entered the warehouse. In fact, his approach was so quiet that his greeting startled me. Good morning, Erasmus. I, oh, oh, good morning, sire. I didn't hear you enter. Of course you didn't. You were too busy. Tell me, old friend, how much wealth is there now accumulated in our treasury? How much? You mean everything, master? Everything. I have not studied the numbers recently, but I would estimate that the goods in this warehouse is worth in excess of seven million gold talents. Good. Now, suppose I were to convert everything I own in all of my other warehouses and emporiums into gold. How much would that be? I, I don't know for sure, sire, but I would calculate a minimum of another three million talents. Excellent. Now, listen carefully. I want you to begin immediately to convert everything I possess into gold. But, sire, I don't understand. This has been our most profitable year. Why? Because of all my possessions, the most precious is time, and the hourglass of my life is nearly filled. It is my desire to distribute all of my wealth among the poor of this city. I shall keep only enough to complete my life without discomfort. I also wish to transfer the ownership of every emporium to he who now manages each for me and give each manager 5,000 gold talents as a reward for their years of loyalty. I, I have always obeyed your orders, sire, but I can hardly believe what you're saying. There is one more order. I want you to transfer immediately 50,000 gold talents to your name. Then I ask that you remain with me until a promise I made long ago is fulfilled. I am your servant forever, Master. But 50,000 in gold? For me? You have earned far more than that, old friend. Your loyalty has been my greatest asset. Now I urge you to carry out my wishes. And when it is done, come to my home. I want to tell you about the promise I made and share the secret with you. It shall be done, sire. And so it came to pass that within a short time, Hafid's wishes were consummated. The most powerful trade empire of that day and time ceased to exist. I went to my master's house and told him the task was done. He was highly pleased. Then... He asked me to accompany him up a marble stairway and along a corridor until we reached a heavy oaken door. We entered a small room that was unfurnished save for an iron-bound cedar chest in the center of the floor. Hafid knelt quickly before it and unlocked its heavy lid. Then he turned to me and spoke. Erasmus. If this room were filled to the roof with diamonds and gold bars, the total couldn't possibly equal the priceless treasure within this chest. What is it, sire? Ten scrolls. Ten leather scrolls. Scrolls? Is this the secret to which you referred? Is this chest connected in some way with a promise you have yet to keep? The answer is yes to both of your questions. What is written there that makes them so valuable? All but one of these scrolls contain a principle or a law that enables anyone who applies those precepts to become a master in the art of selling. Did you find this priceless knowledge somewhere? No, they were given to me. Or rather, they were entrusted to my care. I was made to promise under oath then I would share their full contents with only one person. And who is he? I don't know. 
I was told only that I would recognize this individual, even though he might not know he was seeking the scrolls. I... I don't understand. Nor do I, although I've waited patiently for many years. And while I waited, I put the knowledge of the scrolls to work for me. And as you know, I became what many call the greatest salesman in the world, just as he who bequeathed the scrolls to me was the greatest salesman of his time. Who was he, Master? A very wealthy caravan owner named Petros of Palmyra. I worked for him as a camel boy. You, sire? A menial camel boy? <laughs> it was a long time ago. But I was ambitious. I wanted to improve my lot. So I went to Pathros and told him I wished to become a salesman. He laughed at you? No, he didn't laugh. But he warned me that the life of a salesman is not an easy one. That the rewards were great only because so few possess the strength and endurance to succeed. Then he tested me. In what way, sire? He entrusted me with a piece of merchandise from the caravan's regular stock. A red woolen robe. He said, take this robe, return to that small village we passed through a few days ago, I think it's called Bethlehem, and try to sell the robe at a profit. If you succeed, I'll consider your request to become a salesman. After the caravan owner had given you the robe, sire, what did you do? Exactly as Pethros suggested. I returned to that little village and spent the entire day trying to sell my single piece of merchandise. It was a small town. The square was filled with farmers and merchants and vendors and shepherds who seemed to have brought their flocks with them. It was very confusing. Bazaars were crowded and noisy. Were you successful? <laughs> Decidedly not. Some of my prospective customers said my price was too high. Others couldn't make up their minds. The Roman soldiers made fun of me, and one shop owner became so angry he threw me bodily into the street. But you persisted. By sundown, I was so tired and discouraged I could hardly think. I had no money to pay for shelter at the end. So, with the unsold robe still in my pack, I rode my donkey into the hills to search for a cave where I might sleep. Did you find shelter? The only cave I found was already occupied. A poor man and his wife and a newborn child. They said I was welcome to share the cave, but that didn't help my low spirits. There was a cold chill in the air. And I noticed that the mother's thin cloak was all that covered their sleeping child. You couldn't be blamed for the weather. No, but I had a warm woolen robe in my pack that I had been unable to sell. Then suddenly I knew exactly what to do. I gave the robe to the mother who wrapped it around her sleeping child. You must have been very discouraged to just give it away. Oddly enough. Erasmus, I wasn't discouraged at all. In fact, I was almost jubilant. I resaddled my donkey and rode back to the caravan that same night. And what did Pedro say? I didn't see him until the next day, and by that time I was discouraged all over again. I confessed my failure. Was he angry? Not Pedro. He told me to go back to my camels. Yet, when seven days had passed, he sent for me again. That's when he gave me this chest and the scrolls and exacted my solemn promise to pass them on to someone else. Who? When? I don't know. But I'm sure I will know if I ever meet that person. It has indeed been a strange and wonderful experience, sire. The wisdom that's on these scrolls, the knowledge that has enabled you to achieve such success, can you tell me what it is? I can't allow you to read and study them because of my promise, but I know each scroll by heart. I can tell you the essence of what they contain. I shall be forever in your debt, Master. Very well. Take each scroll separately from the chest. Read the title, and I will speak. The first scroll is titled, Today I Begin a New Life. Ah, yes. Today I begin a new life, and its substance is as follows. 
Today I shed my old skin, which hath too long suffered the bruises of failure and the wounds of mediocrity. Yet I will not fail, as the others, for in my hands I now hold the charts which will guide me through perilous waters to shores which only yesterday seemed but a dream. And how will this be accomplished? For I have neither the knowledge nor the experience to achieve greatness. And already I have stumbled in ignorance and fallen into pools of self-pity. The answer is simple. I will commence my journey unencumbered with neither the weight of unnecessary knowledge or the handicap of meaningless experience. Nature already has supplied me with knowledge and instinct far greater than any beast in the forest, and the value of experience is overrated, usually by old men who nod wisely and speak stupidly. In truth, the only difference between those who have failed and those who have succeeded lies in the difference of their habits. Good habits are the key to all success. Bad habits are the unlocked door to failure. Thus the first law I will obey, which precedeth all others, is I will form good habits and become their slaves. I will read each scroll for thirty days in this prescribed manner before I proceed to the next scroll. First, I will read the words in silence when I arise. Then I will read the words in silence after I have partaken of my midday meal. Last, I will read the words again, just before I retire at day's end. And most important, on this occasion I will read the words aloud. As I read and reread the words in the scrolls to follow, never will I allow the brevity of each scroll, nor the simplicity of its words, to cause me to treat the scroll's message lightly. Yes, today my old skin has become as dust. I will walk tall among men, and they will know me not, for today I am a new man with a new life. The title of the second scroll, sire, is I Will Greet This Day With Love In My Heart. I will greet this day with love in my heart. And how will I do this? Henceforth will I look on all things with love, and I will be born again. I will love the sun, for it warms my bones. Yet I will love the rain, for it cleanses my spirit. I will love the light, for it shows me the way. Yet I will love the darkness, for it shows me the stars. I will welcome happiness, for it enlarges my heart. Yet I will endure sadness, for it opens my soul. I will acknowledge rewards, for they are my due. Yet I will welcome obstacles, for they are my challenge. I will greet this day with love, and I will succeed. The scroll marked three. I will persist until I succeed. I will persist until I succeed. I was not delivered under this world in defeat, nor does failure course in my veins. I am not a sheep waiting to be prodded by my shepherd. I am a lion, and I refuse to talk, to walk, to sleep with the sheep. I will hear not those who weep and complain, for their disease is contagious. Let them join the sheep. The slaughterhouse of failure is not my destiny. The prizes of life are at the end of each journey, not near the beginning, and it is not given to me to know how many steps are necessary in order to reach my goal. Failure I may still encounter at the thousandth step, yet success hides behind the next bend in the road. Never will I know how close it lies unless I turn the corner. Always will I take another step. If that is of no avail, I will take another and yet another. In truth, one step at a time is not too difficult. I will try and try and try again. Each obstacle I will consider as a mere detour to my goal and a challenge to my profession. I will persist and develop my skills as the mariner develops his by learning to ride out the wrath of each storm. So long as there is breath in me, that long will I persist. For now I know one of the greatest principles of success. If I persist long enough, I will win. I will persist. I will win. The scroll marked four. I am nature's greatest miracle. I am nature's greatest miracle. 
Although I am of the animal kingdom, animal rewards alone will not satisfy me. Within me burns a flame which has been passed from generations uncounted, and its heat is a constant irritation to my spirit to become better than I am, and I will. I will fan this flame of dissatisfaction and proclaim my uniqueness to the world. I have unlimited potential. Only a small portion of my brain do I employ. Only a paltry amount of my muscles do I flex. A hundredfold or more can I increase my accomplishments of yesterday, and this I will do beginning today. I will win, and I will become a great salesman, for I am unique. I am nature's greatest miracle. The scroll marked five. I will live this day as if it is my last. I will live this day as if it is my last. And what shall I do with this last precious day which remains in my keeping? First I will seal up its container of life so that not one drop spills itself upon the sand. I will waste not a moment mourning yesterday's misfortunes, yesterday's defeats, yesterday's aches of the heart, for why should I throw good after bad? I will avoid with fury the killers of time. Procrastination I will destroy with action. Doubt I will bury under faith. Fear I will dismember with confidence. I will make more calls than ever before. I will sell more goods than ever before. I will earn more gold than ever before. Each minute of today will be more fruitful than hours of yesterday. My last must be my best. I will live this day as if it is my last. The scroll marked six. Today, I will be master of my emotions. It is one of nature's tricks, little understood, that each day I awaken with moods that have changed from yesterday. Yesterday's joy will become today's sadness, yet today's sadness will grow into tomorrow's joy. And how will I master my emotions so that every day is a happy day and a productive one? I will follow this plan of battle before I am captured by the forces of sadness, self-pity, and failure. If I feel depressed, I will sing. If I feel sad, I will laugh. If I feel insignificant, I will remember my goals. Today, I will be master of my emotions. Today, I control my destiny, and my destiny is to become the greatest salesman in the world. The scroll marked seven. I will laugh at the world. No living creature can laugh except man. Trees may bleed when they are wounded, and beasts in the field will cry in pain and hunger, yet only I have the gift of laughter, and it is mine to use whenever I choose. Henceforth I will cultivate the habit of laughter. I will smile, and my digestion will improve. I will chuckle, and my burdens will be lightened. I will laugh, and my life will be lengthened, for this is a great secret of long life. And now it is mine. And most of all, I will laugh at myself, for man is most comical when he takes himself too seriously. Never will I fall into this trap of the mind, for though I be nature's greatest miracle, am I not still a mere grain tossed about by the winds of time? Do I truly know whence I came or whither I am bound? Will my concern for this day not seem foolish ten years hence? Why should I permit the petty happenings of today to disturb me? What can take place before the sun sets which will not seem insignificant in the river of centuries? Never will I allow myself to become so important, so wise, so dignified, so powerful that I forget how to laugh at myself and my world. I will be happy. I will be successful. I will be the greatest salesman the world has ever known. The scroll marked eight. Today I will multiply my value a hundredfold. I am likened to a grain of wheat which faces one of three futures. The wheat can be placed in a sack and dumped in a stall until it is fed to swine, or it can be ground to flour and made into bread, or it can be placed in the earth and allowed to grow until its golden head divides and produces a thousand grains from the one. And how will I accomplish this? First I will set goals for the day, the week, the month, the year, and my entire life. 
Just as a rain must fall before the wheat will crack its shell and sprout, so must I have objectives before my life will crystallize. In setting my goals, I will consider my best performance of the past and multiply it a hundredfold. This will be the standard by which I will live in the future. Never will I be of concern that my goals are too high, for is it not better to aim my spear at the moon and strike only an eagle than to aim my spear at the eagle and strike only a rock? Today I will multiply my value a hundredfold. I will commit not the terrible crime of aiming too low. I will do the work that a failure will not do. I will always let my reach exceed my grasp. I will never be content with my performance in the market. I will always raise my goals as soon as they are attained. I will always strive to make the next hour better than this one. I will always announce my goals to the world. Today I will multiply my value a hundredfold. And when it is done, I will do it again and again, and there will be astonishment and wonder at my greatness as the words of these scrolls are fulfilled in me. The scroll marked nine. I will act now. I will act now. Henceforth, I will repeat these words again and again and again, each hour, each day, every day, until the words become as much a habit as my breathing, and the actions which follow become as instinctive as the blinking of my eyelids. With these words, I can condition my mind to perform every act necessary for my success. With these words, I can condition my mind to meet every challenge which the failure avoids. Only action determines my value in the marketplace, and to multiply my value, I will multiply my actions. This is the time. This is the place. I am the man. I will act now. The scroll marked 10. My faith in God. Who is of so little faith that in a moment of great disaster or heartbreak has not called to his God? Are not our cries a form of prayer? Henceforth I will pray, but my cries for help will be only cries for guidance. I will pray for guidance, and I will pray as a salesman in this manner. O creator of all things, help me. For this day I go out into the world, naked and alone, and without your hand to guide me, I will wander far from the path which leads to success and happiness. Assign me tasks to which others have failed, yet guide me to pluck the seeds of success from their failures. Confront me with fears that will temper my spirit, yet endow me with courage to laugh at my misgivings. Help this humble salesman. Guide me, God. So it was in this manner that I was able to learn something of the secrets of the scrolls. Hafid bade me put them back into the chest. He locked it. Then we retired from the room. Nearly three full years went by, and since he had disposed of his wealth and disbanded his trade empire, there was very little for my aging master to do except wait. I was his sole attendant. Then one day, I answered the door, and a stranger stood before me. His appearance was not impressive. Dressed in a tattered loincloth, his hair was snarled and long. His eyes were red, swollen, as though he had traveled for many days under a blazing sun. Yet his voice was firm and strong. I would speak with your master. And who are you? Please, I mean no harm, nor do I seek arms. Let him hear my words, and then I will depart if I offend him. No, I, I would rather not who disturb... Who is it, Erasmus? This man is unknown to me, sire, yet he asks for you. Art I... thou not he who has been called the greatest salesman in the world? Well, I have been called that in years gone by, but not recently. What seekest thou of me? Come in, come in. I will speak quickly, so you may understand. I am a follower of the new truth, as given to the world by Jesus the Christ, who was born in Bethlehem and then crucified in Jerusalem. Jesus? I am not familiar with that name. I know, and it is my fault, because I was divinely selected to tell the world, and so far I have failed. No man fails if his determination is strong enough. Tell me about this man, Jesus. 
In Jerusalem, the, happening the stranger then related his story in detail. He told of a Messiah whose coming had been foretold by Jewish prophets, and how Rome had conspired to kill the Son of God. How four long years had gone by, and still only a few people listened. Then he told my master how a divine voice had spoken to him and said the truth is an idea, but ideas must be sold to those who do not know. So he was directed to come here to Damascus and learn the secrets of a great salesman. As the stranger continued, I noticed that my master became more interested, especially when the birth of the Messiah was described. in a cave in a town called Bethlehem. He possessed nothing except the truth. The only thing he owned when they killed him was a simple red robe. Roman soldiers gambled for it at the foot of the cross when they crucified him, but I searched for it, and I have it with me now. A robe, may I see it? In my pack, here. Hmm, it can't be. Yet it is. Yes, here's the mark of Petros sewn into the hem. The same robe I tried to sell so many years ago. Tell me, tell me your name. I was given the name of Saul, but it has been changed to Paul. And your home? A city called Tarsus. But now, if you will help me, I must travel to spread the word. Erasmus, Erasmus. Yes, sire? Go immediately to the upper room. Fetch the chest which contains the scrolls. I will give them to Paul of Tarsus. At last, we have found the greatest salesman.